Hello, I'm Michael Casey. I'm the Chief Content Officer at Coindesk, and I'm honored today to be here for a wide-ranging discussion on the backs of the IMF's newly released Global Financial Stability Report. In particular, we're going to be discussing Chapter 2, the one that is entitled The Crypto Ecosystem and Financial Stability Challenges. And I'm delighted to be joined for that by the two authors of that chapter, Evan Papagiorgio, who is the Deputy Division Chief in the Monetary and Capital Markets Department of the IMF, and Dimitris Trikopoulos, who is the Senior Financial Sector Expert in that same department. Uh, welcome to you both. It's good to be with you, Michael. So, Evan, I'd like to put a question to you first, and that is to uh, compare where things were now to where they were in 2018, when, as you note in your chapter, the Financial Stability Board uh, released a statement essentially saying that there was no real material risk in terms of global financial instability from the crypto markets. But since then, it's fair to say that you know, the circumstances have changed significantly, largely because the, the market capitalization, the sheer value of an amount of money tied up in the crypto markets is so much bigger. So is that leading to any increased concern amongst international policymakers about the risks associated with this sector? We decided to write a chapter with um, a large team of people here at the fund uh, talking about both the opportunities and also the challenges um, that are inherent in the uh, crypto ecosystem. Uh, as you mentioned, um, back in 2018, uh, both we, the IMF, the fund, and the Financial Stability Board, um, at the time when we had looked at it, we had evaluated that as the issues not being as perhaps systemic or financially uh, uh, or, or in, a, in, a, in a very serious uh, financial stability risk. Uh, but since then, uh, several things have taken place. Several channels perhaps have, have developed and uh, we think they uh, require a closer look and closer inspection on these issues. Um, first of all, the, the market cap of crypto assets has grown uh, massively, almost by 10 times uh, uh, from the beginning of 2018 until, let's say, September of this year. Uh, second, the importance of crypto assets in some uh, countries has risen, um, particularly smaller economies, emerging market economies in particular. Um, although overall there hasn't been a spillover from episodes of let's say, loss of confidence in crypto assets to, to other markets. Uh, third, uh, the exposure of the banking system or the financial system, perhaps, to crypto assets is also growing. And that is a particular sense of, of urgency to address these issues. Uh, and then perhaps um, last, the use of crypto assets in payments and uh, settlement is still limited, but this can change quickly, especially through uh, the, uh, you know, the, the stable coins and other similar arrangements. And I should say, finally, there are also new sources of risk uh, that did not exist perhaps back in 2018, uh, namely um, you know, decentralized finance or DeFi and you know, stable coins that I mentioned a, a second ago. Great. Thank you very much for that, that answer, Evan. Uh, Dimitri, picking up on what Evan was saying about the emergence of DeFi and stable coins, and they really have exploded in terms of uh, at least the interest in this, this sector over the past year. Um, you know, regulators are trying to get their heads around this. Um, is there a risk that as these new regulations come into force, they will not have the kind of consistency across jurisdictions that we'd want? that there's a regulatory arbitrage risk associated with this? And does the IMF have its own set of best practices that you're advising countries to take to in order, in order to ensure some level of harmony across these regulations? Thank you, Michael. Yes, there are some guiding principles. Um, I think that's strike exactly on the issue of regulatory arbitrage, like you said. So uh, and the regulation should uh, take into account when there's the same activity, when then it does, it poses similar risks, then the rules should also be similar. Um, of course, we want to be technology neutral and the regulation should be proportional to the risks and functions. So if something is not systemic, it should not be a priority of the regulations. But also, as you mentioned, DeFi and stable coins, this is an area which presents also unique risks. Um, some of the unique risks of stable coins have to do with how their price stabilization mechanism works, their reserve management. DeFi also has a lot of technological risks. So regulations should take into account also the unique risks that the, this sector poses. 
Thank you very much, Dimitri. Uh, Evan, I'll throw to you now uh, again, and and I want you to to think about some of the big price movements that uh, you know we always see in some respects in the crypto markets, but in particular, uh, a couple of uh, big events. Uh, one in in March twenty twenty was the most significant, where you know the entire market kind of uh, really collapsed, as did a lot of traditional markets for that reason, uh, on the back of the pandemic suddenly becoming such a big issue for the global economy. And people were wondering at the time, you know, whether stable coins and DeFi markets would suddenly have this systemic failure because the, nobody would be honoring the stable coins and the algorithms wouldn't work and so forth. But actually the system held up very well in a way that it made it feel like a real world stress test. Um, and, you know, these markets in many respects are being constantly challenged in this way and they grow and there's innovation and development on top of that, there's iteration. And so some people say this is the best way to build a resilient system. What do you take from that and what, what lessons can be learned from, from these systems as they operate through these stress tests? Michael, you are making some good points. Uh, indeed, the crypto ecosystem did have a big uh, uh, stress test, as you mentioned, uh, in uh, March of 2020. And again, pretty much the entire market had a had a uh, stress test, uh, but it recovered and showed the resilience, as you said. Um, I think to a certain extent, some of that is also part of a, a, an ecosystem or an asset class, if you will, that has grown significantly. And along with that, also the the come the necessary or the the, the usual price declines or or stress tests, if you will, that get along with this. Um, there's a certain things that I would like to, to perhaps take one step further from what you mentioned, uh, although indeed perhaps, uh, you know, there were elements of resilience, there were also elements of, of, uh, of failures. And there, um, this has called, has created a call to action on uh, looking more carefully uh, what are the, uh, the, the, the specific issues relating to stable coins that you mentioned, and then perhaps other types of crypto assets. So we know that stable coins tend to have uh, poor disclosures overall, and they may be subject to runs that we have seen that, uh, which may trigger fire sales and create other knock-on effects or contagion risks, if you will, as we like to call them. Um, now, of course, Stablecoin um, uh, issuers are improving on on their practices. They they improving their disclosures, um, but we feel there is more needs to be done. You know, a higher level of disclosures and and, and perhaps an upgrade, if you will, of the standards is uh, is necessary. Almost akin to those that we use for money market funds. Um, you know, and one example is Tether, where uh, obviously the largest uh, stablecoin by market cap. Um, they have disclosed their composition of the reserve assets, but the disclosure perhaps hasn't gone far enough or hasn't been uh, audited by uh, independent uh, auditors or accountants. Um, and there is still more needs that needs to be to, to be to be really, to be um, uh, disclosed there in terms of denomination, denomination of currencies or other issues. So we feel that more needs to be done. Uh, I would say the the best way of, of, of describing that it would be along the lines of the financial stability boards boards uh, high level recommendation with uh, on the principles of uh, that that stable coins that operate that there should be on the same business same risk same rules underlying principle um, that should be able to to match uh, their function to what they have to to disclose and how they have to be regulated and supervised. Great, thank you, Evan. Uh, I actually like to drill down a little bit further on on that one. Um, you know, the 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 reality, at least the way the market has treated um, these stable coins. I'm thinking specifically of USDC, and you mentioned Tether USDT. Uh, it's been interesting to watch the way that the prices have come increasingly uh, close to this one to one pricing, and and that which seems to speak to what people's expectations are in terms of those values. What, what do you think that that's telling us in terms of the risks or otherwise associated with these stable coins? Uh, absolutely. Uh, in fact, the price has uh, stuck closer to this peg, the one-to-one -one peg you mentioned, in fact, has improved over uh, uh, recent months. Um, and the average deviation from uh, this equilibrium rate uh, has actually uh, declined, which means it's much closer to what you would expect from it. Um, so, 
perhaps if you were to take this at face value, we tell you that you know that the mechanism is working, and that's a welcome development. Uh, that's how. That's what the purported purpose or the the the, uh, the purpose of this stablecoin is, and therefore what that's what it should be doing. But on the flip side, you cannot assume that they will, this will always be the case. In fact, we had an example with um, Iron, uh, the Iron stablecoin that collapsed after one of its uh, underlying uh, uh, collateral um, uh, crypto assets also lost a, a, a big part of its value. And there it was clear that the issue of regulation or of, of, of disclosures and the supervision uh, came right front and center. Uh, so, um, indeed, it's very important to have the price mechanism reflecting uh, that things are stable, but also uh, as a matter of priority, uh, there should be also an effective risk management framework with respect to the, to the credit, to the liquidity risk, as well as uh, operational, uh, the general AMT, AML, CFT, anti-money laundering, uh, and uh, combining the financing with terrorism regulation, as well as cyber risks and other regulations that should be in place for, uh, for stable coins. Uh, okay, uh, thank you for that, Evan. Uh, Dimitri, picking up on what Evan was just saying there about um, Cybersecurity regulations and uh, you know illicit activities, uh, uh, money laundering, and so forth. Uh, um, there's this idea that comes up. It comes up in your report, and it's often mentioned by regulators that the anonymity of crypto and also the absence of a custodian and the absence of an in, of an intermediary are risk factors because of the you know regulators can't trace it. They don't know whether there's illicit activity happening on those. But of course, crypto advocates take a very different perspective on this. They talk about it being a feature, not a bug, right? The idea that is that because there's no intermediary between participants, there is no Lehman Brothers like critical point of failure in the system. Um, you know, and that, that there's, they'll suggest that by imposing surveillance and heavy reporting rules on a system that is designed to be resilient because of that, you know, disintermediated structure, that you're now introducing instability risks to the system. Um, why wouldn't you sort of prefer to focus on smart on-chain analysis rather than this sort of uh, de-anonymizing de process, which, you know, as I said, some people would argue brings more risk into the system? Thank you, Michael. Um, I think uh, the idea that there is no critical point failure has proven to be very faulty on its own because we have seen a lot of uh, hacks um, that happened on, especially on DeFi, and we have seen that the code has been faulty in many cases, uh, which allowed these hacks to happen. So there definitely needs to be some sort of consideration of um, how the code is vetted, um, and the decentralized version, the current decentralized version of DeFi, in that sense, is, is somewhat problematic. Uh, another issue is that I think there are also voices within DeFi that recognize that some of the preventative measures that financial institutions take in terms of customer due diligence, record keeping, reporting, uh, suspicion transactions could also apply to DeFi uh, if, it, if it has to become mainstream. So I, I think it's very difficult to bypass this type of uh, requirements. Uh, and it goes against what we were saying earlier, earlier about same risks, same rules, um, same activities. So I think that there is scope to to implement some of the guidance, for example, from Financial Action Task Force uh, in this area. Uh, in terms of the on-chain analysis, I would say that this is a very promising avenue. Uh, it seems that countries are looking at it more and more to to take on take on board information from on-chain analysis. But it seems it also is in a very early stage. Uh, again, in the report, we point to a survey that the Financial Action Task Force did and showed very large uh, variability on the results uh, between different uh, on-chain analysis providers on the activity in terms of peer-to-peer -peer and illicit uh, activities on, the, on their measurement. So it's promising, but it, it has a long way to go still. Okay. Um, thanks for that. Uh, just uh, another concept that you raise in the report, Dimitri, uh, is this concept of you're calling it cryptoization. 
Um, and it's specifically referring to the, you know, the, the emergence of using crypto assets in countries that uh, perhaps might be, there might be concerns about their macro conditions, about the state of their, their own domestic currency. And we're seeing this trend, you know, in, in relatively uh, fast growth in, you know, across Africa, across Asia, Latin America. Um, you know, is there any way that governments in those places could turn what seems to be a negative, right, that there's a bet against their national currency going on here, to turn it into a positive? Because, you know, there clearly is, you know, innovative potential. There's the, there's the capacity, in some respects, to leapfrog if you were to, uh, you know, encourage smart, well-regulated innovation uh, in the crypto sector. Can they turn this, can they take advantage of what might otherwise be a negative into a positive? For sure. I think we mentioned that cost, speed, access are uh, three things that crypto can, the crypto ecosystem can do well. Uh, transparency perhaps might be one that it's a bit more problematic as we discussed earlier. But all these are problems that existing um, payment, cross-border payment infrastructures have. So, the crypto ecosystem can help in some regards. Also, I would note that the, the international community is also working to fix those uh, issues with the payments. You know, there's an initiative on the G20 on uh, fixing some of these issues on cross-border payments over the next few years. Uh, but going back to the issue of um, leapfrogging and so on, uh, I think we should be careful uh, because we are essentially talking about cryptoization. We are renaming uh, dollarization to cryptoization. So there are elements of dollarization which present macroeconomic risks and financial stability risks, so which are well known. So dollarization creates issues in terms of the independence of your monetary policy, and cryptoization can also create the same risk. Uh, there could be issues in terms of currency mismatches in your economy, uh, on the balance sheets uh, of uh, households, corporates, and so on, creating funding and solvency risks. Again, this can arise with dollarization and as an extension with cryptoization. And then there is another issue which come on top, which have to do with the ecosystem, the crypto ecosystem. Um, consumer fraud, something that we haven't discussed uh, so far, is something that's quite prevalent so far uh, in its early stages of the crypto ecosystem. Financial integrity, there are additional issues with financial integrity that come in. So uh, again, as we say, there are risks uh, for sure, and there are opportunities, and there is a very interesting balance that uh, many economists have to navigate over the next few years. Great. All right. Well, I think that's all we have time for for now. Um, thank you both, uh, Evan Papagiorgio and Dimitris Strakopoulos, um, for the very comprehensive uh, chapter in, in the, financial, the, the Global Financial Stability Report. Um, and thank you very much for, for taking these, these questions and uh, letting me grill you on them a little bit there. Uh, thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Um, I'm Michael Casey from Coindesk. Um, farewell.